what is the opposite of if you see something, say something? I think it's probably if you don't see something, then you don't have to do anything. And that's what I mean by blind injustice. It's the intentional refusal to see something so that no obligation is created to do anything. On any given day, roughly 30,000 immigrants are held in civil detention facilities across the country. And over the course of a year, over 400,000 immigrants are detained. Intentionally removed from public view, shuffled constantly from location to location, subject to heavily restricted access and without any ties to the community, it is easy to not see these immigrant detainees. Circumstances conspire to maintain the status quo of deficiency and tolerance for the intolerable. Policymakers pushing for more beds, for more arrests of immigrants, private detention facilities profiting from filled beds, and municipalities balancing their budgets with ICE contracts have little incentive to fix a system that is so lucrative. Until public opinion forces policy change, circumstances will not improve. In order to promote just treatment of civil detainees, the first step is to document their treatment and remove society's blinders. Ending complacency and initiating an end to human rights abuses in civil detention facilities and the corresponding negative health impacts begins with documenting existing conditions. This summer, I began the process of documenting human rights abuses in the U.S. civil detention system at an, as an intern at the Bellevue NYU program for survivors of torture. Based at Bellevue Hospital in New York City and directed by Dr. Alan Keller, PSOT is dedicated to promoting the health and human rights of individuals, communities, and society by providing outstanding clinical services to victims of human rights abuses and through innovative educational research and advocacy initiatives. PSOT is also recognized in the U.S. and internationally as a leader in promoting the health and human rights of imprisoned immigrants. My research focusing on identifying specific causes and risk factors of deaths in immigration detention through a rigorous examination of public records will be included in an article authored with PSOT for publication in a scholarly journal. Now, it's critical to understand why detainees immigrate in the first place in order to understand the risk factors when they arrive. Factors leading to a decision to undertake the dangerous journey to the United States initiate a cascade of events, each of which negatively impacts the immigrant's health. Fleeing death, persecution, and extreme violence at the hands of gangs like MS-13, men, women, chil and children, a majority of whom are from South and Central America, have no alternative other than embarking on the dangerous journey to the United States. Whether on their own or assisted by paid coyotes, the journey itself is arduous and unforgiving. Border Patrol agents frequently capture immigrants suffering from dehydration, malnutrition, physical abuse, and symptoms of PTSD. It is in this beat up condition that soon to be detainees are welcomed to the United States and tossed into a system wholly unprepared for them and unable to address their fragile medical condition. Wave after wave of immigrants enter the U.S. immigration detention system every day, making it the largest national immigration detention system in the world, with over 400,000 people housed temporarily each year at a cost of $2.5 billion. On any given day, over 40,000 immigrants are apprehended, processed, and detained, an extraordinary increase of nearly 500% since 1994. The scores of undocumented immigrants apprehended at the borders makes immigrants the fastest growing segment of the U.S. prison population. Even with unprecedented growth in private prisons and vacated beds and jails across the country, the number of immigrants still far outstrips the ability of DHS to house and care for all of them. Official policy, untethered from the substantial needs required for its enforcement, creates its own hardships through ever-increasing goals of arrests and detentions unsupported by either infrastructure or an organization necessary to accommodate the detainee population. Chronically locked into catch-up mode, the U.S. civil detention system, even, it want, even if it wanted to improve, simply lacks the tools and support to do so. Lacking any semblance of appropriate facilities, DHS resorts to using old Walmart super centers, empty warehouses, and tent cities donated by FEMA as civil detention facilities. Now imagine 1,500 boys aged 10 to 15 with new arrivals daily confined to a Walmart. These makeshift centers, others of which house girls and adult men and women, lack adequate sanitation, privacy, medical care, supervision, beds, or recreational areas. Without any other provisions, immigrants corralled behind chain link walls sleep on thin mattresses directly on concrete floors, trying to stay warm with only a thin sheet of mylar as a blanket. To better control the detainees, lights are never turned off, air conditioning is kept at uncomfortably cold temperatures, 
and noise from people or loudspeakers blares throughout the night. Immigrants arriving at the border already physically exhausted and psychologically stressed enter facilities that are conducive to further mistreatment. Civil detention centers pose substantial health and human rights concerns as overcrowding combined with poor supervision result in a lack of medical care and documented incidents of sexual assault and other forms of physical abuse. Detainees experience a combination of abuse, lack of protection, and inability to report their conditions leading to hopelessness that often re-traumatizes re them, causing further psychological and physical distress. Now let me share an extraordinarily sad story with you. This past summer, Roxana Hernandez, a transgender woman fleeing Honduras, showed up at the border requesting asylum. She was processed and placed in the icebox, a facility notorious for its freezing cells, inadequate food, and lack of medical care. Border Patrol policy restricts holding a person in these cells to no more than 12 hours. Roxana was held there for five days. Transgender women are notoriously targeted and harassed by guards and inmates and experience high rates of violence and abuse. Roxana lacked adequate food and had no access to medical care. Her health and spirits declined rapidly. Less than 10 days after her request for asylum, she was dead. Border Patrol listed her cause of death only as pneumonia and complications associated with HIV. Consequences of detention in substandard facilities that exacerbate existing medical conditions directly correlate to negative health outcomes. Health and human rights are interrelated. When human rights are promoted, health is promoted. And when human rights are violated, there are serious health consequences for the individual and the community. Although extreme, Roxana's story is not unique. Since 2010, 74 people have died in civil detention. And now it's essential to understand why these detainees died, especially if any of the causes could have been pre prevented. Freedom of Information Act requests led to the release of 52 death reviews generated by the ICE Office of Detention Oversight. These reviews are the only available record of events leading to deaths of individuals in ICE custody and, vi and vary widely in quality, with many reports being incomplete or cursory. Existing systemic deficits in immigration detention facility health care are exposed when the same types of health care and oversight failures are present in so many reports. Most of the detainee death reviews examined by medical professionals since 2010 include evidence of dangerous and subpar medical care practices. Prepared by independent third-party investiga investigators, these death reviews are a factual window into the events that scrupulously avoid drawing conclusions. But without a conclusion, the reports are not useful in finding negligence or assigning responsibility. Inferring that specific actions carried out by particular individuals led to the death of a detainee is the first step in correcting the deficits in the system and holding detention center personnel responsible for the consequences of their actions. Without any accountability, either personal or on the part of the government, there is no motivating factor to induce change. After weeks of researching civil detention centers, on Monday, July 30th, I visited the Hudson County Correction Facility, or HCCF, located in Kearney, New Jersey. ICE houses roughly 800 civil detainees there, filling two-thirds of the jail that would otherwise be vacant, and paying the county over $35 million per year. Even after reading and writing about civil detainees for the past three years, I was not prepared for my encounter with the people I'd been studying from afar. Meeting detainees face to face profoundly affected me, bringing to life the suffering and abuses I had only read about. On the last visit, one female detainee was using a bra as a sling for a clavicle fracture, and another woman who had recently miscarried in jail and had hemorrhaged badly was given antibiotics and sanitary napkins for weeks instead of being taken to an appropriate medical facility. Before we left, we spoke with Ron Edwards, director of the jail, Congressman Payne, and the staff about improving detention conditions. While it was generally acknowledged that there is room for improvement and the situation is difficult all around, such aphorisms highlighted how intractable a problem this is and how the detainees are treated as less than human because they are not seen as people, but as a problem. Okay, so what's the point of investigating the plight of civil detainees? Why should we care about undocumented and presumably illegal immigrants? What is the point of combing through death reviews to find examples of systemic abuse and negligence, and assuming that we can agree on the importance of defending human rights for every person, regardless of where they come from, and that the United States has a moral, if not legal, obligation to offer refuge to those fleeing persecution or threats of death. What do we do with that? 
Researching and analyzing the U.S. immigration detention system, drawing conclusions as to its debasement of human rights and abrogation of our country's moral obligations, and then publishing these ideas has only one purpose, non-complicity with what's wrong. Non-complicity requires action to engage those who can institute change. Through activism, lobbying, education, and as the civil rights leader, Bayard Rustin implored, speaking truth to power. We can no longer be blind to the treatment of immigrants passing through the U.S. civil detention system. We must see, we must say something, and we must act. Success is often defined as a predetermined goal. If that's the case, I'd like to suggest that success with respect to immigration detention would be evidenced by its eradication. This is not to say support illegal immigration or an anarchic everybody does what they want to attitude, but that enlightened immigration policy would obviate the need for civil immigration detention. Perhaps there will come a time when our country sees the value in welcoming those who yearn to be here, and instead of locking them up, we set them free, empower them to fill their dreams alongside our own. But until then, there's still much work to be done. Thank you.